Hi, I'm Rob, N1NUG, and in today's video, we're going to take a look at these two Yagi antennas that Guzizu sent me to review and share with you. We're going to start off looking at the 70 centimeter Yagi. Now, you can see here I've got all the pieces that were in the box spread out on the table. The first and biggest piece that we have, of course, is the antenna's boom. Now, this is made out of aluminum, but there are threaded inserts here for the elements to thread into. Now, one thing to note is that on one side of the boom, it looks like numbers are sort of laser etched into it to correspond to the elements. These, of course, are all different lengths. The reflector, the driven element, and the director. Now, the next thing I've got, obviously, is the instruction manual, and this tells us kind of how to assemble everything. And then I've taken all the loose hardware that comes with the antenna, and I've put it in this bowl so I don't lose it. Now, we get a U-bolt and a clamp in order to clamp this thing to a mast, and there are a couple of butterfly nuts and some washers to kind of lock everything in place. And then we also get this rod and this clamp assembly with another butterfly nut on it, and these are for the matching network for the driven element. Assembly of the antenna itself should be pretty straightforward. As we've already seen, there are numbers laser etched into the boom, one, two, and three, and then each of the elements has a number etched into the fitting here, which corresponds to the number on the boom. So for instance, I've got number two in my hand, so I'm gonna turn this around so I've got the threaded side out, and then I'm just gonna insert the element so that the threads engage. And of course, this is a thumb screw on here, so we're just gonna tighten this up by hand as best as I can get it, and then we'll repeat the process for the other two elements. The next thing we want to do is take the small rod that came with all the loose hardware with the antenna and stick it into this receptacle right here. And then you can see there is a Phillips head screw right there. And we'll just tighten that up. Next, I'm going to grab this coupler. You can see here there are two cutouts on either end of it. One of the cutouts is going to clamp around the driven element. And the other cutout is going to clamp around this short piece. I'm going to get this in position. I'm just going to snug this up so it doesn't fall off, but I can still slide this back and forth. Now I have, of course, misplaced my metric ruler. So I've converted the 20 millimeters over from the instructions to inches. That works out to 0 0.08 inches. So we're going to push this coupler almost all the way to the end of the small rod here. And then I'm going to lock it into place. That seems a little far out to me, but We'll test this out later, and if we need to adjust anything, we can slide this in if needed. And then the only thing left to do is to install the mounting hardware on the end of the antenna. So I'm going to bring in the clamp, and I'm going to put that towards the mast. And then I'll bring in the U-bolt so that when this clamps onto our mast pole, it clamps between the U-bolt and the bracket. And then over here on this side, I'm just going to install the hardware loosely for now until we get this thing up on a mast. Put down the flat washers first, and then the lock washers, and then I'll put the thumb screws on. Now that we've got this all set up, let's kind of do an overview of the construction of this antenna. Now first off, you can see the feed point is housed in what appears to be a stainless steel block, and even the SO239 appears to be stainless. Now as we saw with the feed point, all of the elements on this antenna are sort of hollow aluminum tubes, and of course, we've got these rubber caps to keep stuff out of the tubes. As we've already seen, the mast itself is an aluminum tube. And of course, we've got rubber caps on either end to keep stuff out. And it looks like all the rest of the hardware on here is either aluminum or stainless steel. So that should be good for extended use outside. This stuff shouldn't rust and cause problems with the antenna. Now, one thing I do want to point out is that the mast is sort of open to the elements on the side opposite where the threaded insert is, where all these elements go in. So conceivably, if you mounted it like this, rainwater and other stuff could get in there and kind of fill up the mast, and maybe even the feed point, and cause problems. So if you're going to mount this permanently outside, I recommend flipping it over so the driven element is facing down. And you may even want to consider sealing everything up with some kind of non-conductive material like silicone, or some other epoxy just to keep all the junk out of here. Now that we've got the antenna set up, let's test it out with a nano VNA. You can see I've just connected up with a short piece of coax and I've got the antenna mounted low on a short piece of mast so that the coax will reach. If we try and run the nano VNA off of a long piece of coax with the antenna up high, 
we're gonna get weird results. So for testing purposes, this is the way we're gonna set it up. Here's a look at the SWR plot from the Nano VNA. You can see that the SWR is best right around the center of the band at 442 megahertz. We're looking at 1.173 for SWR. Now if we slide up to 460 megahertz, if you're a Rush fan, you'll be happy to see that the SWR is 2.112. And then if we slide down to 426 megahertz, you can see that the SWR there is 2.012. As we saw in the Nano VNA plot, the antenna looked pretty good in the 70 centimeter band. But if we wanted to tune it, all we have to do is loosen this thumb screw and slide this adjusting bracket up or down. Now we don't have a lot of room to slide it up, but if we loosen this and slide it down, it should actually lower the resonant point of the antenna. Let's take a look at another VNA plot so you can see that. Here's a look at the SWR plot with the bracket slid about halfway down the tuning rod. You can see that the resonant frequency is now about 433 megahertz with an SWR of about 1.156. So for the purposes of trying this out with a radio, I'm gonna slide this back up to its original location and we'll see if we can make any contacts on this thing. Now that we've got all the testing done, we can get this back up in the air with the longer piece of coax and bring a radio in. So I ended up bringing out my Kenwood THF6 as a test radio for 70 centimeters. The only other radios I have capable of 70 centimeters are mounted permanently in my cars and kind of hard to get to. <laughs> and then the other one I have is this old Kenwood TW400. Now, this can generate CTCSS tones, but I can't find the manual to remember how to set all the dip switch patterns on the bottom of the radio for the right CTSS tones for the local repeaters. So we're stuck with this HT and we're only putting out maybe three to five watts or so, I guess. But let's see what we can do. Now, my location is usually pretty bad for 70 centimeters. There's a couple of DMR repeaters within, I don't know, 10 miles or so that I can hit. But for analog repeaters, I usually have trouble even on a vertical antenna with the radios in my car. So let's see what we can hit with the HT and the Yagi antenna up on the test pole. So I haven't seen these before because I don't usually look at 70 centimeters, but there should be two repeaters kind of in town here. So let's try it out and see if we can hit either one of them. N1 NUG testing. Welcome to the N1 TUP repeater, PL 151.4. Okay, and I realize you can't see the screen on the HT, but that one was full scale. Hopefully you heard the audio there. Seems like it was working okay. N1, NUG, clear. I've got another repeater that's further away and it's sort of behind a ridge line. I think I can hit it, I just heard a signal on it. Although because my antenna is on a test pole, it's moving around and fluttering a bit. But let's see if we can key it up with the HT and I'll let you hear what it sounds like. N1, NUG, testing. Okay, I was able to hit it, but you can hear yeah, see, it's coming and going. It's fluttering. So I really don't even know if I'm hitting it or just keying it up. N1, NUG, clear. As you heard, I was hitting the repeater with the HT, which again is no small feat given my location and the conditions I usually experience on 70 centimeters. Now, the signal was fading in and out because the antenna is moving in the wind. So there is that, but it does seem to be doing the job. Next, we'll take a look at the five element Yagi. We've got all of the pieces out of the box and laid out on the table. This time we have five elements and we have a two piece boom, but sort of the same design with the laser etched numbers on one side and the threaded inserts on the other that match up with numbers that are etched into each of the elements. And then once again, we get a mounting bracket, a U-bolt, and the hardware we need to set up the matching network. To assemble the antenna, the first thing I'm gonna do is put the two pieces of the boom together. Now you can probably see here, this has one of those spring tabs that should lock into a hole in the open end of the boom. So we'll just get that oriented and slide it together. Just like with the other antenna, we have laser etched numbers on the boom that correspond to laser etched numbers on each of the elements. And just like with the other antenna, once we get the numbers lined up, 
I slide the element through and thread it into the insert in the boom and then tighten it up good and tight by hand. So we install the matching element the same way we did on the other antenna. Just insert it into here and sort of tighten up this screw. And then once again, I'll bring in the tuning clamp and clamp it to either side of the elements here. Now, according to the instructions, this antenna needs to be 18.5 millimeters from the end, which is pretty close to 20 millimeters, truth be told. And when I was tuning the other antenna, it didn't seem to be all that critical. So I'm just gonna kind of eyeball this for now and we'll plan on tuning it later when we get this set up on the test pole. And then just like with the other antenna, we'll install the mounting bracket onto the end of the boom. We'll drop on the flat washers first, then the lock washers. We'll just put the thumb screws on loose for now. Fit, finish, construction, and materials on this antenna are all pretty much identical to what we saw on the three element. Now again, I've mounted this one sort of the right way up this time, where I've got the threaded part of the insert kind of facing up to keep the weather elements out of the hollow part that's on the bottom. And just like with the other antenna, if you're gonna set this up for a long period of time, you'll probably wanna silicone this up just to keep water out of it. Although I don't think the water would really hurt anything, you just might wanna keep stuff out of it. And then once again, because the screen is barely visible to my eyes, we're gonna to switch to a screenshot to make looking at the SWR sweep a little bit easier. Here's a look at the SWR plot for the five element antenna. You can see that the resonant frequency is about 436 megahertz with an SWR of about 1.1. The bump that you're seeing in the SWR curve here is caused by a bad calibration when I took these measurements. I recalibrated the Nano VNA and got a clean curve with about the same minimum SWR at the same frequency, but I forgot to take screenshots when I did it. Either way, the antenna looks pretty good across the 70 centimeter band, just like the three element antenna did. If we take a look at this screenshot, you can see that the SWR is about two at 462 megahertz. And then on the low end, the SWR is about two at 421 megahertz. So I've brought the HT out for some testing again. I'm gonna try that weaker repeater that we were picking up on the three element antenna and see how it comes in on the five element. N1 NUG testing. Okay, if I get the antenna pointed just right, it seems to be coming in at about half scale. So it's a little bit stronger than it was on the three element antenna. And it seems to be a little bit less susceptible to the fluttering in the wind, although the wind is a little bit less than it was this morning, but just by a little bit. So I think this antenna is doing a better job. N1 NUG clear. Now I'll try that repeater that's kind of closer in and was more or less full scale on the other antenna. I'm going to assume it's going to be full scale on this one too, but we'll check it anyway. N1 NUG testing. Welcome to the N1 TUP repeater, PL151.4. Yep, and that seems to be working pretty good. Aside from the mistake in the Amazon listing that labeled this five element single band 70 centimeter antenna as a dual band antenna, I think overall these are pretty decent 70 centimeter antennas. Quality of material, ease of construction, kind of fit and finish is about the same with both of these antennas. They're basically the same design, one's just bigger. So I think overall you're getting a pretty decent product for what they cost. The only other real kind of big problem with these antennas, and maybe it's not a problem for you, is the fact that they're set up so that they can only be vertically polarized. If you want to horizontally polarize these, you're going to have to drill your own holes in the boom so that you can rotate the clamp 90 degrees. Now that's not a huge deal for most of us, but it's something to consider if you're buying these antennas and want to use them horizontally. I'll leave an Amazon affiliate link down in the description for both of these antennas. But again, keep in mind that this five element Yagi may be listed on Gozizu's site as a dual band antenna, and it is not a dual band antenna. So keep that in mind if you're looking at the description for this one. That's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. 7-3, and thanks for watching.